Okay, it's 10 o'clock. I think we're ready to get started. Uh, the purpose of this meeting is to share information about encumbrances and expenditures, contracts that have been awarded, changing needs in the community, and projections of future need, and engage the public in a debate about how future coronavirus aid, relief, and economic security CARES Act grant money is spent. Uh, could you please take the roll? Yes, ma'am. Council Member Dunaway? Present. Council Member Days? Here. Council Member Walton Gray? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble using the new computer. Present. Madam Chair, you have a quorum. Thank you so much. The committee takes official notice of and admits into evidence all St. Louis County ordinances and resolutions. Thank you all so much for being here on this manic post-holiday morning. Um, I hope everyone had a really nice long weekend and also took a moment to reflect on those who have given their lives so that we have this great America and great St. Louis County. Um, I, I know we just had a meeting a couple of days ago, but I think it's really important for forward momentum that we continue talking about this new, this newly unveiled budget and break it down into smaller pieces. We hope to start with that today by going into a deeper dive on the Department of Public Health's budget for the crisis. Um, I'm going to now hand it over to Cindy Brinkley, who has, I believe, a presentation where we're <clears> going to talk about a few of the issues that have come up so far, and we'll get into more nitty gritty uh, into the budget. So, Cindy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, Chairwoman Dunaway and Council members. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, I have several um, colleagues with me to talk through some of the issues at the request of the council, uh, some of the issues regarding the uh, Dignified Transfer Center, and of course, the Department of Public Health um, budget as well. And I will also speak to the Small Business Relief Fund and give a status update on the uh, Municipal League's request for funding. So, Chairwoman, if it's if it's okay with you and the council members, what I would like to do is to turn the presentation over to two colleagues, one of whom is Jen Keating. She's the Interim Director of Procurement, and also Dee Vinker, who's the Director of Transportation and Public Works. These are two individuals that I, I believe can speak to the Dignified Transfer Center, the, any questions that the council members may have, and to um, get into additional details. So if, if that's, um, if, if you agree with that, Chairwoman, I'd like to just turn this over to those um, individuals. That would be great. Thank you so much. And I believe they're on. <clears throat> and Chris, you have their presentation, so you can maybe go to the. Yes, ma'am. Um, just so I, who am I switching to first? Jen, will you be speaking first or D? I think we're going to speak together, kind of go back and forth. Okay. And I think you're going to need that presentation up, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Great. So, um, Cindy asked us today to talk about the uh, Dick uh, Transfer Center. And um, we had put together, D and I had put together a spreadsheet of showing the cost of the project and the procurement method for the contractors that worked on the construction or renovation of the building. Uh, so we thought it would be helpful just to go through this spreadsheet uh, line by line and just talk about the individual contractors, how they were procured, and, uh, and details about the project itself. So, um, can I can I can I, yep. can I stop you for just a moment? And sure. Councilwoman Days and Councilwoman Gray, if you um, if you disagree, please let me know. But I think our biggest concern is yes, we're concerned about how we got these contractors. But our biggest concern is minority participation, and that's what we really want you to talk about today. We don't want to go line by line through like how each one was procured. Um, but we want to know how we are ensuring that our projects, including this one, are meeting our standards for minority minority participation. Okay, uh, Councilwoman uh, Kelly, 
uh, Dunaway, I think that that is correct. Let's cut to the chase and get to the exactly what it is that we're looking for uh, and, and go from there. I agree. I agree. That's all I'm saying. I'll agree. Thank you. Okay. So there were several um, different types of contracts, and that will speak to the minority participation in each of those. Uh, the county currently has um, seven annual on-call contracts that we used to, to build out this project. And uh, all of those were procured prior to the MWBE ordinance and the impl uh, implementation of the MWBE program, with the exception of one. Um, you can see the award dates and effective dates and how those lay out. Um, but Reinhold Electric was procured after the implementation of the MWBE program. And um, that was a uh, contract was procured with participation requirements. How that works uh, with an annual on-call contract is, is different than how it would work if we were just to, you know, initiate a contract for a specific project. In the case of this on-call contract, they have a participation requirement that must be met on an annual basis monthly uh, submit documentation as to the work that they've done for the county and the participation that was achieved during that time frame. Um, and so they are held to those requirements on an annual basis. The MWBE program then evaluates uh, that participation, ensures that the, the subs that were used on the project did are, do meet the certification requirements and are truly certified MWBE. Question? So, yeah. Yep, Question go ahead. Here. So you're saying Reinhold is the only one, only contractor we have on your team here that, um, that was a, um, a contractor after, after the ordinance, after That's the MBEWB ordinance, Reinhold Electric, that's the only one. That's correct. And you're saying that the 26.11% is over a year period? No, um, and Deanna can speak to the percent on this spreadsheet, but what they are evaluated as a contractor is their participation over an annual, uh, in one year, each each year they're reevaluated. So Deanna can speak to the project itself and what the participation amounts are proposed to be. So the, what we're showing for Reinhold is um, their participation through invoices thus far. And my understanding is, is these are all being reviewed right now uh, through our diversity office, but they're looking at uh, Butler Supply and the work that they have done and their, their participation thus far. And they're a WBE um, company. And they're a WBE, okay. Yes. Except I believe, and Jen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, within um, Reinhold's contract, it has a, an M, MB Eagle and a WB Eagle. Is that correct? That's correct. So, so, you, so in, uh, in this particular instance, you don't have any MBE? What for this specific work that they were done within their overall on-call contract, what we're showing thus far is um, no MBE work. No MBE had, work. Okay. They had WBE work. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So that's that was it for this one. But again, they have the year's worth of contract work to reach those goals for both MBE and WBE goals. So the other um, two procurements, uh, two emergency procurements were made in order to, um, to get the DTC uh, established in a very short time frame. We also used a Missouri state contract and then we, um, St. Charles County had two on-call contracts that were used as well, to partner in the, in the project. So I can speak to um, moving forward, uh, the procurement uh, division, as well as transportation and public works has a great interest in, um, in soliciting for a kind of a, 
I don't know if we call it a general contractor, but a, a firm that uh, would have a bunch of different um, of requirements to it. So different trades where you would have HVAC uh, or, and um, electrical, um, all the different kind of trades that could be, that would normally be found in construction type projects, having uh, a kind of what we call a conglomerate uh, contract. And Dee might be able to speak a little better. She's had experience with that, but it would give us the greater opportunity to have um, MWBE participation um, in a contract. We need to kind of align some of these contracts and, and get them uh, kind of on the same time schedule so that we can solicit them together. So there might be a couple little extensions here and there, but what we would like to do um, is, is solicit that as one as one project per se, or one annual on-call contract, thereby increasing our chances uh, for having MWBE participation in these trades. Okay, question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, Council, yeah. Councilwoman Days. Yes. So, so let's just, as an example, let's just say, who is this Merlot Plumbing? Okay, Merlot Plumbing, uh, if, if their contract was extended through this COVID process, would they be required to have an MBE WBE participation? Because they would be, they would be past the ordinance. They would be, in in other words, the ordinance takes place. Then you've extended their contract. Does that flow as well? Um, usually, extensions are all with the same terms and conditions of the original contract. If we so that's a no. Terms and conditions, we would have to resolicit. Yeah. So that's a no. So, okay, so all of these people that are on this sheet that you gave us, all these contractors, they probably had extensions of their contracts, correct? Yes. Okay, and so, but that does not apply because uh, we're just continuing on with the old plan and not really taking into effect what the new ordinance says. That's correct. We can't change the terms and conditions of a contract. We could do, um, we could speak to our legal team and talk about that, but usually the terms and conditions go with the solicitation and how it was solicited. Okay. Well, it could be some different things that you're looking for, even in extension. So I'm just trying to make sure I'm getting it correctly because as I'm being asked the question, what is the minority participation in the, um, Dignified Transfer Center. I would be correct in saying that there was zero uh, minority participation in that project. I'm, I'm looking at Deanna. I'm, I'm, okay, sorry. Um, in, in looking at the way, and I don't have the specifics on Charlene's, um, I mean, JW Mechanical, I'm not sure if that's an MBE or a WBE, the way that was spelled out. Um, but given them, we, we grouped, uh, the M and the W together in this scenario here. So, um, I'm unable to answer that question with this information. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't think that it's, um, uh, would be that difficult because all of these, what you told me would be extensions. Everyone on this list, every contractor on this list is an extension. And Reinhold Electric is the only contractor that came in after the ordinance. They have a requirement of MBEWBE, and this 26.11% is WBE, which is Women Business Enterprise. Is that correct? Madam Chair, can I ask a question? Yes. Um, Councilwoman Days, are you are you talking about perhaps doing some sort of an addendum to an existing contract? Is that what you're getting to that would require the um, minority and women business participation? I am I'm not sure if that's if, if that is something that we can do. I believe she just said that you can't do that because an extension is you just go by the old rules. I believe that's what I just heard. Correct me if I'm wrong. So I don't know. I would have to, I mean, an extension itself, yes, that would be the same terms and conditions. We would have to do 
um, an addendum to a contract to change those terms and conditions, and both parties would have to be willing to do so. It is not something that we've looked into, but we could definitely ask the county counselor's office for some advice on that. They're on the line. They're on the line now. Um, Genevieve, I think she's here. Oh, as we talk yeah, I about think this, perhaps she can look at this, but I just want to make sure I'm clear when I hear the numbers. I don't like the uh, in the books or whatever they call it. I just want to make sure of what I'm hearing so that I can uh, uh, um, relay that to the constituents that are asking. Some of these businesses are asking me, and I don't have the answer. So at this particular point, I'm going to go with zero minority business participation went into the dignified transfer center. Did you, did, sorry, Councilwoman, did you want Jen Frank to, to respond? Uh, she, she probably don't have to look into it, but yes, she can respond if she has an answer. Right. I think each one, each contract would be need to be evaluated. Um, Jen is correct that um, generally uh, contract extensions are done on the um, same terms as, and conditions as the original. I think if you're talking about changing the terms and conditions, that's something that our office would need to evaluate and would need to evaluate for each individual contract. It's certainly something that um, that the office can look into. So going forward then, um, and, and we're gonna have to make sure that this is correct. Um, so going forward, then this is where we have to have the equity lens, if you will, going forward. with We have an ordinance in place uh, uh, i.e. only for the construction is my understanding so I don't know going forward what we would do but absolutely I would be in, would encourage you to check with the department I don't know if the department is on and we had a comment but to check with the department to make sure that um, that we're doing what we say we're doing that's my only issue is that we're doing what we say we're doing if we're interested in minority participation let's have minority participation if you're not, say it. Move on. So all of our all of our new um, solicitations since the all uh, solicitations since the passage of the ordinance have had participation requirements. So that we we haven't acted that completely. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for on, interrupting. Please. Can everybody mute your line if you're not speaking, please? All right. Sorry. Go on. So um, all, all um, construction solicitations since the passage of the ordinance have had participation requirements. The uh, procurement division also implements a 5% bid incentive for all um, invitation for bids and, um, and, and requests for quotes. And we also do a 15% incentive on all requests for proposals. So those are some additional ways that that ordinance has been implemented. It's not just construction. So I just wanted to, um, to, to mention that so that you're aware the procurement division takes very seriously um, the, the act of, of including uh, minority and women businesses in all of our solicitations. It is the fact that these annual on-calls um, are older contracts and um, as they come up for solicitation, as, as I mentioned earlier, what we would like to do is put um, a, a large amount of these single trades into a single solicitation to increase the MWBE um, participation that we would gain through that process. So I agree with you. Um, I think that one of the ways that we can, can work towards this is that as these contracts come up for renewal, the procurement division and all the departments within the county can choose not to renew them and instead to resolicit them and that is something that is under our power to do and we can encourage our departments especially those uh, for construction since that is the largest usually amount of participation that we get through the mwb program to uh, to solicit those rather than renewing so that they do fall under the new ordinance going forward and, and that is part of, that's been our discussion with the Office of Procurement as we move forward 
and trying to develop more of a, I'll call it like a master contract um, with a general contractor with all the different trades that fall then underneath it. So that any one of those trades, uh, no matter how small the job is, has the ability to go out to an MRWBE contract. Um, the challenge now is we have one contract with one company um, to do that work. And if it's a small job, then there's no opportunity to divide that work up um, into uh, smaller pieces. So it, it really limits the amount of, of DBWPE participation within those jobs. But if we roll it back up into a larger contract where you have a general contractor with all the different trades then underneath them, we have the ability um, then to hire uh, or the, the that, that general has the ability to have subs um, that fall within those trades that can meet those requirements much much better. Okay, well, Madam Chair. Yes, Councilwoman Days. These are, um, these are the questions, these are the things that I am going to be looking at very, very closely. I'll let you know that. And, and, and I wanna make sure that you understand you know, my position. And, and when you talk about the, the uh, reporting, okay, so the, the terms of the contract, even though the extension, I just wanna make sure I have this correct, the terms of the contract with an extension stay the same, but you're reporting a little differently. Did I get that right? No, I'm not sure what you mean by reporting. Well, because you, you had, a, I, I guess you had it all grouped as one here, MBE, WBE, and then it was kind of broken out. Then all of a sudden Butler came up with just a WBE. So that's, so you can't combine those two. That's, that's what I'm, that's, that's my point. So the contract itself for Reinhold Electric has two different um, requirements, two different participation rate uh, amounts that they have to meet, one for minority and one for women. It's just on this spreadsheet, um, they were put together in one column. Okay. I won't belabor the point. I, I think you understand um, what I'm looking at. If we are the county are going to uh, continue to con consider ourselves uh, minority friendly, women business uh, enterprise friendly, uh, then we, we have to do it. And that, that's going to what I'm going to be looking at throughout this entire COVID-19 process and beyond, and beyond. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Days. And just, and, and also not to belabor the point too much, she's not gonna be the only one that is looking into this and demanding it. Um, and, and frankly, Jen, I'll be in touch with you later today to talk more about this. But I think if we're allowing these contracts to continue in perpetuity in places um, without having to demand something in return as times change, maybe we need to look at our roles. Um, so I, I think this probably requires some more conversation, um, but I did wanna let you know, Jen, I'll be in touch later today. And, and just to clarify, these contracts that were extended were extended for a, a specific time period. They weren't, this, so this doesn't apply to the, the terms and conditions under the uh, initial contract for the contracts that were extended, those those only apply to the end date of the extension. Um, and then when these are finally um, rebid, then the, um, the ordinance, the MB ordinance will apply and will be up to the procurement process. And just also, I would you know remind the committee that um, in extending the contracts due to the emergency um, under the same terms and conditions, uh, to have you know whether or not the ordinance provides for that, the uh, has to agree the other party would have to agree to any um, changes in in certain emergency situations. That kind of renegotiation may not be feasible. Yep, fair point. Uh, anybody else have any questions? Yes, Councilwoman Days. Uh, I, I'm not sure if the department is on, but I'm going to say 
that these folks in procurement need to really work closely with the department. I, I don't know, and I'm not taking over your meeting. I don't know if they have anything to say or not, or even if they are, I hope they're listening. But they need to work with the department. That's what the department is designed to do. And so I think that it is going to be extremely important that they work with the department, not in isolation, because we can we can handle this, we can manage this, but we can't have silos of information here and think we're going to come to um, a good resolution. If this. That's not going to happen. Thank you. So this is Deanna. So I'm, I'm the director of transportation and public works. Um, we actually were meeting right now with the diversity office uh, as we do monthly um, since I've been here that we go over our contracts um, with the diversity office and procurement um, and legal to make sure that we're all, all on the same page moving forward with each solicitation that we do and any of our existing contracts. And if we're falling behind, how do we help them uh, be aware of what's going on and we're watching. So we have one meeting every month with our public work side and their projects and another one um, with our transportation side and their projects. So we are working through that with all three departments are working together to accomplish this goal. Um, and again, there are many solicitations that, that Jen has alluded to um, outside of this individual project here um that we are are working with great thank you madam chair, madam chair can i ask a few questions yes councilman fitch thank you uh first two i think are for deanna um uh, deanna you mentioned that using reinhold um the one that had you know had contract after um they're the only ones after the fact um you said they have to have a year's worth of work to meet the goals uh, is that a year's worth starting on this date of their first, or is it a calendar year? What is that? Jen, you can correct me wrong, but I understood it as a year from the start of their contract. So I think on that screen it shows um, November 14th of 19. Um, so it would be a year from that date to so, uh, November 14th of 2020 is when those would be reevaluated. I do understand um, in talking with Jen, they have to submit in a monthly update on where they are on those goals as they go throughout their the contract throughout the year. Okay, and who's responsible oh. for, oh, go ahead. No, did that help? I'm sorry, I didn't know if I answered yeah. that. Yeah, okay. it did. Okay. Um, who's responsible for ensuring the contractor meets the uh, MWBE percentages before the work is done? Is it the county that says, okay, you're going to get this work, show us that you're going to meet these percentages for the M and the W uh, before the work is done? Is that how this works? Jen, do you have any details? Because I think this is where the challenge falls in place as the ordinance there is the hammer is is at the very end um, that we encourage the contractor, you know, we let them know through our, our meetings that you are on target or you're looking good or, hey, you're falling behind. What are your plans to bring this back up? The penalty um, for not meeting it is at the end of the contract. Is that correct, Jen? That's correct. Is there any way to move it up to the front uh, to make sure before they get the work that they're going to be able to meet these goals or at least have a plan to meet the goals? I think the struggle with um, an on-call contract is they don't know the usage that we're gonna have in a year. Um, so we don't know how much money we're gonna spend on that contract. It's you know usually a, a not to exceed amount um, and so it's hard to apply the goals and, and create a created dollar amount if we don't know how much we're actually going to spend. So that's kind of why Dee mentioned monitoring as we go along. Okay. Uh, what if Reinhold, for example, gets no more county business the rest of that year? How will they ever be able to comply if they're not in compliance now? And, and that's the challenge. And I know we, we're talking with Reinhold now. 
um, to have those conversations, um, to let them know our, our concern and um, how they do plan on meeting. They're, they do have additional work, um, just, just to let you know. So, um, but what, how, what, what are they gonna do? How are they gonna meet those goals? Um, those are our questions to them now. Okay, and one last thing probably for Jen. Um, one of the questions I had that uh, Beth Orwick answered for us earlier in one of our very first Justice uh, Health and Welfare Committee meetings was, in a state of emergency, do these vendors, these contractors, have to meet all of these ordinances? In particular, I asked about the MWBE. And basically she said, uh, well, unless the federal government is part of the uh, COVID-19 CARES Act uh, requirement, funding requirement, requires that they do that, then no, they technically, they don't have to. And I don't wanna put words in her mouth, but basically she said these MWBE uh, may not necessarily be required during a state of emergency because of the situation. Um, how does that come into play here with the DTC? So, Chapter uh, 107-170 provides emergency procurement authority to the purchasing agent, which is our purchasing our procurement director. It allows the procurement director to make a purchase in certain situations in which no competitive um, process needs to be followed. So in a state of emergency, be a natural disaster, a pandemic, something like this. We have the um, the ability to make purchases on the fly without following a competitive process, which would include um, requiring MWBE participation. So it is what allowed the emergency operations center to be able to function at the very start of the um, the pandemic when they were on a seven day, twenty four hour alert and uh, especially for PPE purchases. And this project also fell under that um, kind of time frame. However, as of acting procurement director, once we kind of moved away from that immediate need, we are now um, allowing for emergency procurements. We are trying our best to get um, a competitive process, including MWBE participation uh, in any form, whether it be three quotes, or an invitation for bid or request for proposal, construction, all of the above, um, and kind of follow our same procedures, however, maybe do it on a shortened time frame or something that normally would be an RFP, we might be able to word it as an IFB just to shorten the timeline. So we're doing a lot of emergency procurement right now and we're trying our best to follow chapter 107 in its entirety, which includes MWBE program. We are, um, we're just having to make some modifications due to the time frame that everything is needed at this point. Does that answer your question? I know it was it a does. long answer. Yeah, it, okay. it does, thank you. Uh -huh. And I think we're ready to move on in the agenda unless um, Councilwoman Dace, Councilwoman Gray, any other questions? I had a question I think for um, maybe Jen. Um, the department that Jack Thomas headed, what is their role in the procurement process? Or when do they come into um, play? I can't remember the name of it. So the MWBE program um, is involved in, in several aspects of the procurement process. They work directly with departments when they want to solicit for a construction project. They help them determine the, um, you know, the, the different types of trades that would be involved. And um, they work on outreach when they know that something is getting ready to be solicited so that uh, businesses are aware that a, um, a, a possible solicitation is coming. Then they work um, after the, the submittal is received, they receive um, utilization reports and good faith effort reports that come in with bids. They review all of those and um, make recommendations based on that documentation to determine which uh, bid or bidder um, most met the, the requirements. And if they have 
no um, no bids that met requirements and that uh, their good faith effort documentation is not adequate, then you know, they can um, guide us towards rebidding. And uh, so they play an ongoing part throughout this entire process. And is that the Division of Equity and Inclusion? Is that the name of that? Um, yes. Has um, the director been a new director been um, appointed or are we still looking for someone? Um, not that I know of, no. Is there an acting director, director right now? There is. Fran um, Lyle Wiggins is acting director. Was she there uh, prior to? Was she just promoted? Yes, she yes, she was the deputy director. So serving as acting. That's it. Thank you, Councilwoman Gray. Councilwoman Days? Yes. Anything else? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, the floor is yours. Oh, wait, now I can't hear you again. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There now? Yes. If, uh, so uh, uh, following in the same vein as uh, um, Councilwoman Gray, uh, the role of the equity inclusion uh, sh should probably be uh, uh, looking for contracts and things like that. That should probably be the first place that you go when you're looking for a solicitation. That would be in my mind. For instance, if we are looking for PPE, would you consult the department on on uh, on that? Do they have any uh, minority contractors within uh, um, their purview that they could do that? Is that how it works or no? Um, all contracts are procured, well, not all, but the majority of contracts, especially for supplies like that, are procured through procurement. So we have those contracts, or actually we work in conjunction with departments to have those contracts. So, um, you know, we work with them so that they are aware of uh, and they have access to our financial system so that they can go in and see bids as we are getting ready to solicit for them. We make them aware of um, of the different solicitations that we have ongoing and um, we also do outreach to minority and women uh, agencies throughout uh, the county for every solicitation that we send out. And so we send the bid to, um, I wanna say like about 10 different agencies for every, every single time we put out a solicitation and that is outreach as well. And I know that they do outreach in addition to that. So your outreach is not uh, coordinated. You send one, they send one. Um, we let them know. I mean, they know who we send to because we send it to, every, you know, for that solicitation every single time. Okay. My point is that I, I'm not hearing a collaboration here. I'm hearing of what they do and what you do. I'm not hearing that. Um, and, and perhaps I'm, I'm un, not understanding what you're saying, but you know, in my mind that that's the go-to organization, that's the go-to agency that, that you should be utilizing. And, and so when, when um, um, you know, Councilman Fitch asked those questions, it seemed again that you were dealing in silos of information and not bringing everybody in at the same time. I'm going to be working a little more closely with DEI to make sure that we are all on the same page when we're looking. I don't want to belabor the point anymore, but I don't, I don't want to, um, you know, I don't want to get mired down in semantics. I want to make sure that we understand what we're looking for. We're we'll going forward with this, and then and I will be I will be absolutely working a little closer um, with DEI to make sure that this is happening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairwoman Dunaway, may I may I address the group on this issue, please? Yes, please do. Okay, I I couldn't agree more with with what you're saying, and while I can't speak for the overall spending of the county. What I can address is how we're structured and organized around the 173 million for the, for the COVID funding. And you're right, a coordinated effort is critical. And so you may not recall from last week when we went over the organization structure 
but we've got a leadership team that's comprised of myself, Cora Faith Walker, Winston Calvert, and Hazel Irby. And so having that focus at the top is there. In addition, we have another stream that's our administrative stream. And this is kind of what I call our back office, making sure we've got all of this connected and coordinated well. And that's, that's the effort that Shannon is helping with. But in addition to that, Fran sits on that, on that um, committee as well as other administrative, Todd, um, Jen, others. That, so we are very well coordinated or attempting to be very well coordinated, if you will, on this effort because it's, it's, it's very important. And so having a seat at the table in the very early stages and working through these is what is what we are doing with the COVID funding. So I just wanted to address that, Chairwoman and Councilwoman Days, too. Thank you. Um, are we ready to move on to the uh, DPH budget? Yes, thank you. Great. Okay, um, Chairwoman, I believe we've got a Spring who's on the line who's going to walk us through the um, Department of Public Health uh, budget. And I hope the members have had, I think we sent that in advance, so everyone hopefully has had a chance to take a look at it in greater detail. So I'll turn it over to Spring. Thank you. Um, just uh, reorienting around um, what are our primary goals um, for the, the public health aspects of this, uh, really focused on the broad-based community education and awareness, uh, things that we're doing to reach all audiences um, and really have to push that further as we continue to move forward in ways that we never have before. Uh, really working through the practices of social distancing, all of this business guidance and uh, the testing and prevention uh, pieces. And so if you could advance the slides for me, Chris. Um, health and racial equity have been a focus of the health department for a long time it's incorporated into every one of our strategic plans our operational plans um, each of the ways in which we do that we thought really hard through the building this plan out to make sure that we were utilizing these north star types of um, ideas and missions for how we were planning out our response patterns and so there are multiple things as you continue to see parts of our plan move forward, but um, we centered a lot of what we tried to do to work on health and racial equity. And there were five major areas in which we, we took this quite seriously and planned for how we were trying to do that. So the first is participatory decision making. We do this in the health department a lot. We engage community voice, uh, not just in terms of what are what is important to our the residents that we're trying most to serve, uh, especially those that we see really suffering from the most disparities, those that are the most vulnerable, um, making sure that we are constantly uh, engaged in opportunities to listen, but also in group decision making. And you'll see that as I talk a little bit about the community funding mechanisms that um, we have talked a little bit about in a couple of the previous meetings around recast. So real sharing the power and decision making over how uh, portions of this funding will be distributed to community partners and for services is, is a deliberate practice that we'll be engaging in. Uh, and then also the, the data disaggregation. And I, I don't know if, um, if many of you, I think I've talked to some of you about this here and there, but almost all of the processes that started for this pandemic two and a half months ago started with with paper um all of the original pieces that we got from cdc the pieces that we got from the missouri health department uh was were all paper-based systems and so we've been trying to uh get better data fix the data increase or, or work with or or build partial systems in order for us to, to better understand how we can target um, communication to education materials, uh, testing, anything that we needed um, directly to those uh, who need it the most. And that also helps us prioritize where we need access to care. We always have known that we have big infrastructure gaps in access to care in the region, um, especially in North County. And we, you know, step into those infrastructure gaps on a regular basis. Um, but there are are really some sizable 
areas in which there are major structural gaps. And so many people have been saying and talking about the idea that, you know, there's no treatment right now for COVID. So there's no medication or vaccine or cure yet. But we know well that that does not mean that there isn't a significant need for care. Uh, and a lot of the pieces that you'll see in the budget are, are work towards what we can do to help address that care with these funds. And then prioritizing vulnerable populations specifically. So we will make distinctions in how we are distributing resources focused on areas where our populations are the most vulnerable. Um, we, we have a large county, we have a large geography, uh, we have a lot of people um, certainly, uh, all taxpayers are, you know, in, entitled to, to governmental services, but we will be prioritizing mask distribution, testing services, uh, direct care opportunities and services, communication, uh, targeted messaging and communication needs to our most vulnerable populations. And we all also are really focused on some things that are sustainable. There are many pieces of this money that will be uh, short term, that will be things that are available now, um, but the money will have to be spent um, by the end of the year. Uh, but we have to be here past that point. So the health department has to be here and be able to to be able to provide some of these services past December 31st, 2020. Uh, we do not want this infrastructure to be something that we can't sustain um, because that is a, a further disappointment to the communities that depend on us. So I wanted to, to point those out quite deliberately uh, because we have um, used them as some of our North Star targets in developing this budget and the, the plans that go with it. So the overall budget uh, includes a combination of direct care services. Um, and I'm gonna talk through some of these budget pieces um, soon, but also some of that infrastructure and then some of the community partnering and, and funding opportunities to increase levels of services in some of these target areas. So there's a portion of the budget that is focused on staffing. Uh, this is a result in about 200, a little over 200 um, temp and term staff workers. There are a few positions that we've identified so far, really a couple um, that we will probably need as long term positions. There will be others that we will need to identify as long term positions, but I don't know if I will need 150 contact work tracers and case investigators in my 2021 budget. So, but you all know that that this is the time when we start planning that out. So we are focusing on temp workers at this point. Uh, but we will also be planning our, our 2021 budget and, and how we can kind of manage through that process for the health department. Many of these things will be a significant concern for us uh, throughout 2021. Even if we do get a vaccine in 2021, I will need a significant amount of health staff to make sure that we can begin to get people vaccinated uh, in, in some of these spaces. So uh, there is some staffing. Um, the staffing is focused largely on contact tracing and case investigations, testing staff, some additional education staff out working in the communities and working with um, employers and businesses and schools and churches and, and all kinds of other places on, on educating and uh, some additional communication needs as well as some of those pieces around data. Um, we would really, we are still using like either home built systems or some additional paper things still remain. We're trying to get away from that. Uh, it makes us more efficient with our resources and it is an infrastructure that we can maintain um, with fewer staff as we move into to 2021. Uh, and then there are a significant number of contracted services. And so uh, certainly again, prioritizing that equity and community voice aspects, making sure that we have who will be dedicated. This will be an RFP solicitation um, in order to do that uh, and move that forward. There are also some software purchases. This is really where we get into the long-term infrastructure. Our ability to receive incoming data from the hospital systems, from testing sites and, and lab services electronically, uh, we still get thousands of reports in a week um, that are faxed over our fax machine. Uh, we can get systems that will allow us to do that electronically and will ideally feed right into the types of systems that we can we can continue to maintain moving forward. 
So that's part of that uh, infrastructure for software. And then community I'm sorry, partners. I'm sorry for interrupting you, um, Spring, sorry. Um, but I think uh, Councilwoman Gray has some questions for you. Sure. Yes, I do. But um, how many slides do you have to go through, Spring? I think there were three. Uh, there's a couple that just talk about the budget. And I think I may have had three or four um, just kind of outlining big buckets of the budget. Okay, I, I think I can wait till you finish your slides. Okay. Thank you. So then some additional funding um, for community partners, um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that and just highlight how we use the recast and participatory process in order to do that. Uh, several direct support for residents and community members, and then some additional telehealth and social service support platforms, both for patients of our clinics, as well as any other patients or cases or people who are quarantining at home. If you could move that forward, Chris. Chris, can you advance the slide? Oh, thank you. Uh, so in the community grant program, so $7 million of this budget is focused on the, the community grant provider program. So this is really about increasing access to care, whether that be testing or primary care services or additional navigation services, but uh, so that $5 million uh, broadly in that, but we have also identified a $2 million very explicit piece specific to mental health services. This has been a, a traumatic occurrence to our community and will continue to be so for quite some time. And uh, we have been um, engaged in community related, related trauma work uh, for several years, working with Alive and Well and other partners um, directly in the community on this space. And so we know that mental health services have substantial gaps too. And so being very explicit in the way that, that gets addressed uh, through the recast model. So we've talked a little bit about this, but um, roughly what this will mean is that we will identify resident delegates of our highest need COVID zip codes. Um, and this will be predominantly like the broader swath of North County. And then one uh, zip code has already been identified in South County as well um, with some significant needs. But we need residents, um, people that are most likely to obtain services uh, in some of this space, as opposed to people who may run an organization that wants to apply for services, but people who are, are meant to receive services. Uh, we can do about a two week recruitment process. The recast staff has been developing their uh, platform into virtual meetings. We usually do these in person. We've done this for about four years now. Uh, they help write what we call the scope development. So in every request for proposal, we always have a scope of work. What are the services to be performed? How are they be to be performed? Who is the target audience? Each of those pieces. In the recast model, we work directly with residents to have them make those primary decisions. So what are the services? If we just say it's like $5 million for, for primary care or for testing, like which are the most important pieces of that? What else do you wanna see? What are the characteristics you want those services to have? Who should they be targeting? Should they be geographic in nature? Should they be uh, age-based? Should they be, you know, what, what should those services look like? And then we will use those to modify the online application process that will say you need to pre present your proposal, your application to meet these characteristics or one or more of these characteristics that our community members have asked for. Those applications go up for about 15 days. Uh, and then it is a proposal review process. Uh, in this case, we'll do the compliance check to make sure that the proposals that come in actually meet the CARES funding. Um, because we don't want to 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 think that the our community members will choose something that we actually can't fund through the CARES Act, uh, but then the community members also review the proposals and they um, can participate in scoring them, talk about whether or not this met their expectations or not. Um, there's a couple of DPH members that always participate. That usually takes about a week. And then we would like to send this out for community voting. Traditionally in recast, we go to physical locations and we usually take a couple weeks to go around. But we think that in this case, we could do this um, also with some additional online voting uh, potentially. So we would have to build that process out. But that uh, these are based not on in recast. We don't use any names or identifying characteristics of programs. We just talk about the services to be provided 
and we ask our community members uh, which of these services are resonating with them the most in order to provide those. And then we move immediately into contracting past that point. Okay, before we move, before we move on, Councilwoman Gray does have questions on this slide. Sure. Sorry, it, thank you, um, Councilwoman, my apologies. Uh, can you re um, elaborate on the mental, mental health support section? So uh, the idea is to make sure that funds are dedicated towards the types of mental health services that are that could be COVID related that again, our community would ask for. So we, we leave the bucket open and we don't delineate um, what we think people's mental health services should be. Instead, we ask the residents, what mental health services do you think are the most important right now? Um, what kinds of additional supports would be necessary in order to help improve the, the mental health and, and really trauma needs um, of people who could really are, are very much suffering in our communities right now um, and may have additional COVID related mental health needs. Um, that's, I think I understand why you would do that and it makes sense. But also what about the fact that most people are not aware, first of all, what um, is available and then most are not aware of the need for mental health services that are not um, being exhibited. You know, some people have mental health issues or depression or things as such, but you don't, you can't tell, you don't see it. They don't even realize it possibly that they're going through a mild case of depression. There are, is there someone on this committee team who, um, explains those things and gives them some guidance uh, about mental health support? We do, actually. So um, RECAST has um, a really robust community advisory board. Um, is all I will say, so because the RECAST grant that we've done for four years is from the Substance Use Mental Health Services Administration, mental health has been one of the core features of that grant the whole time. So there's been some great, robust community conversations about um, mental health services and support. So we do uh, always have an educational component to that. And we also uh, make expertise available if a resident asks a question and wants some additional input, um, we make sure that they get an answer um, from, um, from our, our panel of experts. But our community advisory board has multiple um, mental health experts on it. Okay, that helps. And I'll save my other question for when you finish. Sure. So this process does take a little bit longer, but we believe in the robustness of the process um, and we've been practicing it for a long time. We also fundamentally believe in, in this act of participatory decision making um, as, a, as a practice of equity for the health department. Um, Chris, can you advance the slide, please? So other buckets that you will see in the overall budget will include some infrastructure pieces, including increasing some customer safety in our clinics, as well as some tools for remote work. The vast majority of those and contact tracers will be working remotely um, because I, I don't want another 150 people in my building, um, but they, they can work remotely, but it does require some infrastructure for them to be able to do that. And then the biggest single line item in the budget is this massive supply chain piece. Um, so it is a total of $21 million. The PPE and community masks alone are about $6 million. Uh, and we built that out for the rest of the year. So it is uh, up to $2 million worth of the disposable um, surgical masks, as well as an additional million dollars in the reusable cloth, cloth masks. Uh, are, um, not a million dollars, a million order. Um, so we know that we will be replacing these masks for many people um, moving forward. We also uh, have done the invitation for bid for testing kits and lab services in a combined. We know now that in order to get the level of testing and to sustain it throughout this entire period, we will need at least $10 million for the PCR testing, which is the active virus testing and $5 million for ongoing antibody tests through the rest of the year. 
And then there is a line item in there. I do hate the way that this is phrased um, in the budget, but it's called awards, but it is because county budget require it, it's called awards and indemnities. And so they are the physical things that we hand out to community members. So we are going to be buying like little bottles of hand sanitizer, some wipes, some other educational support materials and literature. If I hand it out to the general public or population, it goes in that awards and indemnities. So we did um, put some money into there to also make sure that we were just reinforcing um, our educational practices with some of these these things that that help people remember. Um, I think that's actually the last um, and then it's just some additional pieces, uh, just two slides that that have a cover the pieces of the budget. Councilwoman Chair, Days. A, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Spring, for uh, that overview. I want to know how did you come up with two million for mental health? Where did that number come from? So, uh, well, really, this is, there's just very round numbers. We wanted it to be there and, and uh, available. Um, it was just opportunistically. Um, we know that testing and primary care um, as 5 million, we wanted a, a dedicated line item and didn't want it to be sort of separate. So, but I, I, obviously, you feel that it's sufficient. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if that is, but I just was curious as to how you came up with that number. Uh, the second question I have is how many uh, minority vendors do you have for PPE and who are they? So, uh, I don't know the answer to that. I don't um, am not directly engaged in the PPE process. So there are two, there are a couple of ways in which that's been done. So one has been through the EOC. Um, most of the PPE, to my knowledge, we had no existing contracts um, that were preset in procurement that were that had PPE available. So most of the reviews have been based on price and availability. Um, I'm not part of the decision making process for selecting any of the individual vendors um, in terms of that. They are so that's going to go back to procurement. They're procured items. I don't know how those are are determined. Is procurement still on the line? No, Jennifer. I'm sorry, I stepped away for a second. What was the question? The question is, how many minority vendors do you have that's contracted for PPE and who are they? Oh, um, I would have to look into that. I don't know offhand. Okay, can you get me that information or can you get the committee that information? Um, sure. So uh, most of them are not contracts, ma'am. There, most of these are, we do not have contracts for most of the PPE. So, so that we're just calling them vendors? Right. Yes. Okay. It really doesn't matter what you call them. I just need to know how many businesses, uh, how many minority businesses that, that you have, uh, you're utilizing, I don't want to say contracting with, that you are utilizing for PPE. How many minority vendors are they and who are they? So I guess uh, Jennifer will get me that information. Uh, thank you for uh, the the giving me that award. I look at that look at that number of awards, and and I I was always I was flabbergasted what that what that was. But thank you, thank you for that explanation. I want to go to your te telehealth uh, line here. You have seven hundred and fifty, I guess, thousand dollars. Who is, who will we be con or is that a contract or 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 who will be working with us on that one? It will it will be an RFP. Okay. And that has not been let, right? Nope. Okay. Um, you also have here building equipment and maintenance. Is that for the uh, Dignified Transfer Center or what is that about? No, uh, actually that's for here at the health department. So um, one of the most significant pieces, we're just making improvements to improve the safety in our clinics. So my dental chairs um, in John C. Murphy, are open to each other. We actually are going to have to put walls up in between them. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. And then the the other uh, were, were the the computers. You're looking at that in the software going forward. We're utilizing it now, but that will be part of your process in making sure that we 
uh, continue to do what we can in terms of sustainability of our efforts for uh, our population. Is that correct? Yes, okay, thank you. That's all the questions that I have right now. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Councilwoman Gray. Yes, Councilwoman Days kind of took a couple of my questions <laughs> again, but that's okay. Anyway, I'm just joking. Um, with regards to the PPE and um, minority um, vendors, as was mentioned earlier, have, to your knowledge, well, first of all, if because they have not been um, included before, the PPE is something new, how do they reach out to the Department of Health or Public Health, should I say, or to the procurement um, department, or how do they get in touch with someone? So we have had a, a whole bunch of incoming offers. Um, we have filtered the majority of those through the Emergency Operations Center um, Logistics Group because we've been operating under this public health emergency for so long. And uh, we are just now, I think, as Jen was saying, building out um, out of emergency and, and moving into regular practice. How will we continue to um, to find vendor bids and and move some of those pieces forward? OK, so you have been receiving um, requests to participate from minorities. I often Minority do not yeah, I, I, I know I, I have had a couple, um, but I often don't know. This is spring talk. I'm getting confused as who's talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I thought you said you weren't involved, so this was. I'm not. Uh, okay. I get some of the solicitations, but I don't, um, I don't pick. Right. Okay. So you saying that you do hear from people. So you forward that request or how do you, what do you do? I do. I forward that request to, um, uh, uh, my fiscal office here, and as well as the EOC logistics team, because they've been working hand in hand through this emergency part. Right. So this this is Jennifer Keating again. So the same is for procurement. Whenever we get um, a sales email or a solicitation, you know, um, we send those on to the EOC logistics team, and they actually uh, review and determine what they would like to purchase. And then they come to the procurement division to um, request assistance in making those purchases for PPE. But um, as I mentioned earlier, and as Spring um, mentioned, we're going to be moving away from that um, method now that the emergency and not activation has uh, been reduced. And so we will be actually soliciting for those. So we'll be putting them out as bids. And so um, these vendors will be able to bid on uh, PPE. Okay, so you're going to be moving into the bidding process. Correct. Or soon. Yep. Um, what is this word I got here? So you said the logistics team at the EEOC reviews the request? Uh, they, every time we have an emergency. Yeah, I, know, they, I know, I'm referring to now, or in this situation, yes. So yes, during, during the state of emergency for PPE, especially in this um, pandemic, uh, they have been determining the need, especially because they've been working with the community at large and not with just the county, um, you know, the county departments. And so that they determine the need and, um, and work with vendors that they receive and their contacts that they have in the community to find uh, PPE supplies. The procurement division then vets them to make sure that they are a legitimate vendor and that they're in good standing in the state that they operate. Uh, it's very important because we, we did find a number of vendors who were price gouging and or were fraudulent. And during this time period, they started requiring payment up front especially for um, you know, masks and gowns and things like that. So the county normally never pays in advance, but it was the only way to obtain PPE during this time period. So things have quieted down since then. And so uh, we're moving towards bidding those out instead of purchasing on an as needed kind of basis and stockpiling. Okay. 
Are there look. any are there any questions from any other council members? Okay. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Spring. We really appreciate you being here. I think Councilwoman Day said she had a question. Oh, sorry. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> okay. Um, until you have, until you send out the RFP, if someone is interested in selling the county PPE, who should they contact? So uh, we won't have an RFP for um, PPE, but we are talking about a bidding process. Jen, I don't know if you have like a. a wait, wait, wait. I, I thought you just said that you're going to be bidding out now. Bidding and, RFP. RFP. bidding and RFPs aren't the same thing. I'm sorry. Um, an invitation for bid. Yes. Okay. It's not an RFP. Okay. So. So until that process, if I'm a minority uh, a vendor, who do I contact to say, I have whatever, and I, I can sell this to you, I'm at a reasonable price or whatever, who is that person? So they can send it to um, purchasing at stlouisco.com email. And then our- That staff would be your department, Jennifer? That's correct. And then our staff will encourage them to register uh, with the county to do business with us. If they go on to vendor self-service, uh, they can register their business. And that way they receive automatic notification whenever we put out uh, an invitation for bid. And, they'll and, be where is, and where is DEI in that process? Um, the, the, the need for PPE is determined by the departments and, uh, that, and that bid then is, uh, solicited through procurement and, uh, DEI helps with outreach during that time frame. So if DEI has somebody and, and, and perhaps you don't know about it, again, we're looking at a silo here. Is there any kind of cooperation between you and DEI when we're looking at these kinds of things? Well, I'm hoping that they are um, recommending to the vendor to register to do business with us. So if okay, once so if, already, if they've already done that process, they're already registered, they're already a vendor that, that has, uh, can do business with uh, uh, St. Louis County. What are you suggesting now? Well, then I want to make sure that DEI, and I'm going to check with them to see if they are part of this process, but I want to make sure that DEI is part of the process. So there is no process until we put out a bid. And at that time, it's under the cone of silence. And uh, the DEI program can reach out to vendors. And we reach out to vendors. Everyone reaches out to vendors. But we don't really communicate with vendors prior to a solicitation. We don't, um, and we don't do that with any product that we're buying. We are a low bid process. So once we put out a solicitation, then it is based on low bid. I'm, I, I don't think you're understanding my concern, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. But, but again, sure. I'm looking at the collaboration with the two departments. That's what all I'm asking. Chairwoman, could I could I address Councilwoman Day's? Uh, yes, yes, please. And, and I, I understand what you're saying. And this goes back to how we've structured our organization, if you will, around the COVID spending. As I mentioned, we've got the leadership group and then we've got the administration and the compliance group. And DEI is a part of each of those organizations. Miss Irby is a part of the leadership group. And then Fran Lyles Wiggins is a part of the administration and compliance organization. So that is embedded in there. And that will be because they're there at the table, those kinds of questions. And that's why, you know, obviously we want, you know, that they need to be there is because they can answer and ask those questions and make sure that that is in fact embedded into the process when we talk about doing an IFB, when we talk about if we do an RFP to ensure that that's there around these COVID funds. I don't, and um, that's just kind of the overall framework for this Councilwoman Days. Right, I, I thank you. Thank you for that. And, but my, my, again, my point is even before you go for the solicitation, 
um, you know, what are you doing now in order to make sure that we have participation from uh, minority minority vendors? That's it. So we will. I will not, Madam Chair, belabor the point, but they understand what I need and what I want. Yes, that's what I was trying to um, uh, request as well when I was asking who what is who do the people contact. I mean, uh, there's got to be some type of process, and uh, it needs to be delineated the, the entire process, especially because this is new. So some of these vendors have not participated in this process before and um they're going to need some assistance and that assistance should come especially for minorities should come through uh dei or at the, at the least should i say not just just from them but at the least so i'm hoping and I'm, as well that uh we get this information within the next couple of days um so we can relay it to the community or they can hear it through these um, hearings. Or maybe we should put it on the website. It, it needs to be established and, and put out for the public um, somewhere, some form. Chairwoman, I don't know if I could address that. I, I, think, yes, I think that's a very good idea, I think, and it's probably not a one way it's it, it certainly needs to be on the website but also getting information to each of your offices so you can direct the callers that will be that call into your offices so you can tell them exactly what they need to do and, and what the process is so we'll make well, sure that, we get it, that information to you yeah i don't think we should should have to give them exactly how to do this that should come from someone else but we don't even, I know personally, let me just say, I don't even know where to send them in the first place to start the process. Yeah. So that's what I'm asking. I don't want to be the person to uh, guide them through the process because okay. that's not my um, expertise. And there should be someone, someplace, somewhere there in the county who can do that. We'll make sure I'm, you I'm get that information. I'm going to speak for myself, though. I don't want to yeah. speak for anyone. You can speak sure to me on that one. <laughs> okay. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions or comments about the DPH budget? Thank you, right. Spring. Thank you to everybody. Thanks, Spring. Um, and now I think we're ready to talk about the Small Business Relief Program. Yes. Um, Chris, if you wouldn't mind to advance the slide, please. And go to the um, to the next slide. We've had, um, as all of you know, we've had some um, a great response to this, if you will. Our latest numbers is we've had uh, three thousand one hundred and fifty four applications, totaling thirty nine million nine hundred ninety six thousand four hundred and seven. So just a little shy under forty million dollars. So there's been. A lot of requests. You can see here there's a lot in the unknown bucket in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of uh, mostly jurisdiction, in terms of, you know, where, where are they located, what's the address, and other kind of incomplete information. So, Chris, if you can go to the next slide, please. So uh, our May 31st deadline is approaching and the applications are starting to slow down as we get um, closer to that deadline. Um, just a little um, comment around process so everyone's clear about how we're going to do that. This week, um, we're going to be sending emails, start the email process of and requesting documentation to those who have already applied. And even though the deadline's not here yet, we're gonna start that process. And during this, this is when we ask for documentation to certify their application. And so, and I'll speak to what that actually is in a minute. Those will start to come back. We'll ask for a seven day response window. Those, those responses will start to come back around June 1st. And then for any additional um, individuals, businesses who have applied, we'll send another, we'll send an email to those new applicants on June 1st. So meaning we're gonna start the email process this week, even though the deadline hasn't closed. 
after the deadline closes, we're going to send the email an email to the new applicants asking for documentation. So Chris, if you can go to this next slide, please. So this is the documentation that we're going to going to be requiring from the applicants. And you can see here it's there's a lot. Um, we will have um, uh, and we'll have individuals here who can hopefully answer questions that the applicants may be having. Well, they can email questions in as well as call and we'll, we'll be able to um, talk them through. Based on this, um, our applications that we have, these 3,000 plus may be reduced significantly. Um, based once we ask for applications, once we realize what addresses are valid or not valid, all of that. And so once we receive that, and then of course we get the list back from the accounting firm in terms of who actually is in compliance, who actually qualifies as, a, as an actual applicant. That list will then go back to the council members for their determination in terms of how they actually decide they want to um, choose. So that's just a real shorthand view. What we will share with your teams this week, I want you all to know we'll share with you what the, the letter looks like that's going out to the applicants. So you're aware of it's the thought is, is because we have so many where we don't know jurisdiction, we're not going to send those from the individual council member. It will come from STL County Cares SBR Relief would be the tagline in the email. And then we'll have the verbiage in the letter and we'll share that verbiage with you this week for your input to see if there's any changes you'd like to have made. So we'll get that to you as, as soon as possible. And before then, before we move on, I do have a couple of questions, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. One of the things that came up last Tuesday, you weren't in the meeting, um, Shannon Koenig was here for you. Um, Chairwoman Clancy asked a question about, is your office gonna be providing any rubric or any guidance that we can use as we make de final decisions um, in our district about who gets what? And I just wanted to see if there had been any follow up or if you, if, yeah. Well, we had purposely designed this program to make it individual for each council district. So, in terms of how each council member would like to make those determinations, that's, that's up to them. Um, some, I think, are looking at maybe um, having everyone who applies receive amount if it, if it, if they're oversubscribed. And obviously the math formula adjusts accordingly. And so it's really up to each council member, uh, Chairwoman Dunaway, in terms of how they view it and what's the most important thing in their district. I think the guidance we got last week, if I'm, if I'm correct in this, is that because of what we're going to be doing around child care centers, that there would not be a double dip. So I think if there was a rubric, I think we had concluded, not to speak for the council members here, to the oversight council members, but I believe the thought was is that we would not have child care centers receiving SBR relief as well as a grant that we plan to do um, in the funding that we've allocated for that. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, does anybody ha else have any questions about the small business relief program before we move on to the Muni League request? Uh, I do. Councilman Fitch. Thank you, uh, Cindy. There were 116 businesses that did not give an address. How do you plan to to deal with that issue? So what we will do is is they did, I believe, gave an email address. So we will email them, and then they have an opportunity to provide their physical address. They, if, if we don't get a physical address, I'm sorry, there, there's no way that we can determine which council district that they come from. They actually will not be in compliance if they don't provide us a, a physical address. So there will be a, a um, survey monkey tool that will be used where they'll upload the documents, where they'll put in all of the um, all of the required information around address and that type. So that's how that that information will flow, Councilman. 
Okay, and second question, thank you for that. And second question is the Secretary of State Certificate of Good Standing. Is that something they physically will have to go ask for each of these businesses or is that something that's readily available? I believe it's readily available online. So they can just literally go online and, and download that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I see that Chairwoman Clancy has a question, but she is in the uh, participant list instead of, um, Chris, can you move her from the attendees to the panel? Councilwoman. Good morning. Um, yeah, there you are. My question is, do we know, or do we have a, a best guess at what the soonest date is that um, a small business who makes it through the program will actually get this relief to them. Councilwoman, we are looking at early July is what our okay. target date is. And that early July, meaning that is the suit, that's what your best guess is as, as to the soonest date that the check would actually be written to the business. It is by the time we go through all the compliance, by the time the forms get back, they get registered, they get get all of the back office operations as i call it put in place yes okay thank you mm -hmm. anyone else have a small business relief program question i do not all right thank you councilwoman i think we can move on to the muni league request and uh, i actually don't really have an update i can tell you that we've been in touch with our with our lobbyists in uh, in washington uh, asking for information and we have not yet have a have a response from the United States Treasury on this so we continue to stay attuned to this and follow up and as soon as we hear something we'll certainly let the um, um, oversight council aware of it great thank you does anybody have any questions or comments about the municipal league request I do not thank you I do ma'am council chairman Yes, please go ahead, Councilman Fitch. Cindy, if we don't get an answer from the Treasury Department, what's the plan with that? Well, I um, I think that's something that the Oversight Council needs to address uh -huh. in terms of what's a reasonable amount of time that we decide to wait for this and what's the reasonable amount of time that we then release the funds to spend. So I, I would look for guidance from the Oversight Council in terms of what our next steps are. So I, I would recommend we continue to address this at every one of the council meetings. And, um, yeah, I would just think there's got to be some sort of hard date yeah. because we could get caught um, with sitting on this money and it and lose it if we don't have a date. I agree. Madam Chair. Yes, Councilwoman Days. On our last at our last meeting, um, I, I believe it was um, Councilman Traker said asked a question about St. Louis County being included in that Muni League request. Uh, we are one of the entities I think that would be that has been affected, and so there was no mention of whether we. Well, I think you said we were not. So how does St. Louis County address its needs? regarding COVID if that's not part of the process? Well, um, one of the, you may recall when we were talking about the budget, we had a, a fourth bucket, if you will. We had, certainly we had public health, we had humanitarian, and then we also had the economic recovery. We also had a fourth bucket and that was kind of the overall administrative operations. And, and that's where we have um, put a lot of our expenditures is in that bucket. Well, if I look at the budget, it looks like you just have a 10 percent. Oh God, where's that sheet of paper? A 10 percent reserve. If you look at all the percentages from the from the three buckets that you have, you only have 10 percent that's that's left over. So were you looking at the 47, is it part of one, the economic already, or is that part of the 10% that you're gonna have reserved? Well, let me, let me back up a little bit. Stuff. And I think this went to your earlier question, Councilwoman, and that is, I, you had asked, 
under this request from the from the municipal league could the county i think have some of its expenses reimbursed as well and the answer to that is is yes but currently where we're parking all of that is in the um is in the administrative operational budget that we have there with a to your point 10 million dollar reserve that we Targeted. Because some of these other uh, uh, expenditures, in my mind, probably could have been already with the administrative. We're looking at computer upgrades and things like that, which we're going to be continuing on. In my mind, sometimes that could have possibly been part of um, part of the other administrative budget that we have. But uh, I didn't see that. I did not see that. So I'll have to look elsewhere and figure out if that's going to be part of that. Well, Thank one you. thing that one thing that we have gotten guidance on that it's been very, very clear in the CARES Act, and that is these expenditures are only for COVID related funds. So if we have computer expenses and such, because maybe people are working from home because of changes in workplace and that type, then um, certainly those can the COVID funds can be used for that. Yeah, I think that was in the health department. Uh, where they had equipment as well as software, something else on there that that so so okay that's fine thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman Days. I believe we do have a public comment this week. Yes, we do, Madam Chair. We have one public comment from Tom Sullivan, seven fifty one Syracuse Avenue. University City, Missouri. There still have not been adequate explanation or documentation of the expenditures made by county government in the effort to fight the COVID-19 virus. Last week, I asked several questions of the committee but have not received a response. Then a Sunday editorial in the Post-Dispatch took Mayor Lyda Krusen and County Executive Sam Page to task for not accounting for COVID-19 expenditures, many of which are questionable. As the editorial read, the St. Louis area's two top politicians have pledged full transparency with their coronavirus response expenditures, but their version of transparency more closely resembles a closed bank vault than a window. That would be especially true of county government and this committee. It does not seem you are doing the job for which you were tasked. Councilwoman Day suggested the committee may just be window dressing. She could be right. Also, I think it would be questionable to allocate millions of dollars for child daycare. The virus generally does not infect children, but there are questions of whether they can be carriers. The first wave of virus infections were caused in large part by nursing homes. The second wave could be caused by daycare centers if the kids take the virus home. Thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you for reading them, Diane. You're welcome. Unless anybody has anything um, else, we've come to the end of our meeting and I would certainly accept a motion to adjourn. So move. Am I muted? Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Councilwoman Days. And I think it's just the two of us. So can I? Second. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I had to get on my phone, the computer. I have that new computer. OK. OK. okay. Thank you both so much. Everyone have a great day. This meeting is officially adjourned. Thank you.